morning everyone and uh, welcome to class on first second timothy titus and philemon uh before we continue looking at uh, first timothy uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer so can i ask uh, one of you to please lead us in prayer please anyone to lead us in prayer tarun can you lead us in prayer oh, sure Thank you. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this um, uh, learning that uh, we could receive. We pray that you prepare our hearts and help us to understand what we are reading, Lord. Uh, we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit to interpret what we are reading. Uh, we thank you for this class, Lord. Uh, we pray that uh, we get to put to use all that we are learning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Darun. Okay, so last week I actually missed, uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining chapter 5 verses 17 to 20. Uh, I overlooked that passage and then, you know, I continued, I began, uh, you know, explaining from verses 21 to 23 and I realized that later on. So we will just, uh, you know, go back a little bit uh, to uh, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. I'll explain that and then we continue from uh, where we stopped uh, last week, that is in chapter 6. Okay, so chapter 5, uh, where you know, Paul is basically talking about how to, um, you know, treat or take care of widows. And then he's talking about how to, uh, you know, treat elders or lead spiritual uh, leaders. And then he goes on to talk about, uh, have a personal note uh, to spiritual leader, that is to Timothy in verses 21 to 23. Um, but in verses 17 to 20, he talks about, uh, you know, um, how to lead spiritual uh, leaders or how to treat elders. So verse 17, he says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the world, word, sorry, labor in the word and doctrine. Uh, verse 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muscle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worth uh, of his wages, is worthy of his wages. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Verse 20, those who are sinning, a rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may uh, fear. Okay, so those of you who just joined class, uh, I missed explaining uh, last week, um, uh, chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. I had to begin from uh, verse 17, but I missed that and started explaining from verses uh, 21 onwards in chapter 5. So just thought I'll explain uh, chapter 5, verses 17 to um, 20. Now, in this verses, you know, uh, Paul is instructing on how instructing Timothy on how to lead spiritual leaders, uh, as he's also explained in chapter 3. Uh, or as we see in chapter 3, he calls uh, these um, uh, leaders in the church as elders. The word elders, uh, the Greek word is presbyteros. Uh, so in the early church, the terms bishop, uh, elders, presbyters or pastors are used interchangeably and referred to anyone as providing spiritual uh, leadership. So here he's talking about how uh, Timothy should lead spiritual leaders or how he should treat elders. And so he says, uh, let the elders, which means, you know, uh, whether it's bishops or uh, pastors or deacons, uh, you know, the word uh, is used interchangeably for elder, bishop, uh, presbyters, and it's just, uh, you know, it just means anyone who's providing spiritual leadership in the church, okay? So he says those who are elders, you know, uh, those who rule or those who teach, uh, which means he says those who labor in word and doctrine, um, he says, you know, the, uh, you need to give them double uh, honor. So if an elder, you know, whether it's a pastor or a bishop or a deacon, you know, if he rules well, and uh, if an elder who's teaching, uh, you know, teaching the word or doctrine, you know, if he uh, clearly speaks the, the truth of the gospel, you know, he's, uh, he's teaching the word, preaching the word, uh, teaching the doctrines, um, 
uh, and you know he's doing his work then uh, they are worthy of double uh, honor now the greek word translated honor is uh, has a double meaning okay it has two different meanings this word honor in greek uh, first it has the idea of a price paid or received that means you know so paul is saying that you know those who uh, are elders they are worthy of double honor which means you know um you need to give them what is their wages, what is due for them. Uh, so the Greek word has an idea here of price paid or received. And from this idea of uh, me, which, which it means price paid or received, uh, it came to refer to honor or esteem attached to something or someone because of their value so the basic meaning or the basic idea this word honor has in greek is basically is a price paid or received you're giving somebody uh, you know uh, 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 the price for what you know uh, the, for what they're doing or their value or you know what they bring on the table so you know that is what was the idea of this word honor but out of this idea you know, it uh, 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 it also came to refer to as esteeming somebody, you know, honoring somebody or esteeming somebody, uh, which has to do with you know uh, honoring them because of what they are doing, or uh, you know, uh, uh, for something or someone due to their value, you know, what they do or who they are or their position in society. So uh, this word double honor can refer both to material support and to respecting or esteeming or valuing them for who they are what they do or for the position they uh, hold so paul is telling timothy give them double honor it implies that you know um, he's meaning to say that you know yes we treat all people with honor in the church uh, whether it's widows whether it is uh, you know uh, 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 saints just believers uh, but, you know, those who are spiritual leaders, uh, they deserve double honor or greater respect and regard. And he says, especially those who are, uh, you know, labor in word and doctrine, especially those who teach. And verse 18, he says, scripture says, you know, and he quotes from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4 and Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 7 and uh, you know he's saying the scripture says or the principle that is laid out in scripture is those who serve God you know should be paid or be supported from you know uh, supported of, uh, of what they are uh, doing okay they be, should be supported basis on what they are uh, doing so for example he says the uh, the uh, the whole picture there is about you know when an ox is must is treading the grain you don't muscle the ox that means you don't put that um, that piece uh, or gear over that uh, the mouth of the ox which will prevent the ox from eating uh, the grain okay so he says uh, you know you shall not muscle an ox while it treads out grain uh, which means because the ox is laboring to you know uh, uh, thread the uh, uh, the grain it also has needs a share of the job that it's doing so it can eat the grain as it is treading out the uh, uh, grain so he says the laborer is worth his uh, wages so he's using this principle that's mentioned in deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 and luke chapter 10 verse 7 to say that those who labor um or those who are elders in the church, those who are overseers of the uh, uh, spiritual leadership, uh, those who teach um, the word and doctrine, they should be paid when possible or whenever they work, you know, or, or, and support them for the work they are uh, doing. And then he talks about, you know, in verses 19 to 19 and 20, how to treat a leader accused of. Uh, sin. He says in verse 19, do not receive an accusation against a leader except from two or three uh, witnesses. So uh, if any accusation is received against a leader, you know, don't just receive it automatically. Uh, the accusation should be clearly uh, verified by two or three witnesses, uh, not just two or three people who have 
heard the gossip, but two or three people who have witnessed, who have seen the act, who have, uh, you know, who approve of what has happened, you know, um, you know, hear from them, and um, uh, Timothy should not receive or promote unproven, unsupported, unconfirmed accusations about uh, church leaders. And then he says that, you know, if those who are sinning uh, rebuke them in the presence of all, that the rest may also uh, fear. So even as he says that, you know, hey, elders should be paid their wages, uh, they are due their wages, uh, you know, you need to give them uh, their wages. They also, uh, you know, you have to give them double honor. Of course, you respect everybody in the uh, 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 in church, uh, among the believers, among the saints. But for those who preach and teach, those who are uh, rulers in the church, leaders, they are uh, they uh, um, are worthy of double honor. But also, even as they have these privileges and these um you know, um, these, uh, 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 you know, opportunities and these privileges that they can enjoy, uh, you know, they also have uh, responsibilities. They also have to adhere to certain standards uh, that requires of a spiritual leader. And so he's saying that, you know, if anyone under Timothy's oversight is sinning, you know, or is continuing to sin, which means you have addressed the problem with them, uh, you know, you have spoken to them that they have not heeded and they still continue to sin, then you need to address the matter publicly. And why does he say that? You know, so that all the others may learn and they would walk in reverence before God uh, and, you know, that none of them would be led astray uh, by doing wrong uh, and thinking that it's okay for them to do uh, that sin or commit that sin because their spiritual leader is also committing that sin. It's not okay. Okay, so that is why he says, you know, you know, publicly rebuke such uh, things so that everyone will learn. There will be reverence before God. They would know that sin uh, is judged, sin is condemned, uh, that they cannot continue with this, and also to promote a fear of sin among leadership and the entire. Uh, church okay so that is what um, uh, he writes to uh, timothy uh, about how to treat elders how to lead spiritual leaders in chapter 5 verses 17 to uh, 20 and this is a part that i missed explaining um, last week uh, any any questions on this no questions Okay, there are no questions, and we will move on to where we stopped uh, last class. Uh, we stopped at chapter uh, six, where um, basically, you know, um, in verses uh, 11 to 16, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy about the life of a man of God, and he tells Timothy what he needs to flee from you know, uh, flee from all these wrong things, wrong doctrines, free from, uh, you know, falling into a temptation, snare of uh, becoming rich, uh, you know, and he says, you know, godliness with contentment is great grain. And then he talks about, you know, pursue, he's telling Timothy in verse 11, to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience and gentleness and in verse 12 he says fight the good fight of faith uh, and hold on to lay hold of the eternal uh, life so he's basically um, telling timothy you know uh, instead of pride and riches what are the things that he needs to pursue because these pride and riches are what these false teachers were teaching false doctrines uh, in the church you know, are doing, uh, they're doing this not because they want their doctrines to be known or they're so convinced about their doctrines, which is wrong, but they're doing this because, you know, they want to become rich, they want to make money, you know, that is their whole agenda. It's not about the doctrine, it's not about the truth, they don't care anything about that, it's just that they want to become uh, rich, they want to uh, make money, so uh, Paul is telling Timothy, but you pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience and uh, gentleness um, because these are the things that you know um, uh, has value for uh, eternity okay they're valuable to um, God and uh, he says you know fight the good fight uh, and he 
he gives him reasons why to fight the good fight. He knows that you know Timothy is in a very difficult place, a very strategic uh, city, uh, uh, a very very uh, place, uh, a, a place of uh, uh, a great responsibility, of great importance. Uh, his role there is very very important, uh, and it's very very difficult for him uh, to continue. It's challenging. The role is very challenging, very difficult. He just wants to uh, give up. And so he's kind of encouraging him throughout this letter, you know, various places, telling him what to do, uh, how to, you know, uh, stay on uh, as a soldier. Uh, a soldier does not quit, uh, does not leave the battlefield. He does not run away from his post, his position, uh, his responsibility. He fights to the very end. He continues to encourage him, uh, encourage him, him on the same lines. Uh, in this chapter as well, this last uh, part of his letter, the last section of this letter in First Timothy, and he says, "Fight the good fight." And he's saying, um, you know, uh, he knows that the fight is going to be difficult, uh, but he needs to know that you know he needs to fight this battle because he's put in that place uh, because he's received this order from this great God who's called him, who's purposed this for him, who's given him this position, and he cannot just uh, run away from uh, it. And he has an obligation to see, to serve the creator uh, who gave him um, life. And, you know, uh, uh, to encourage him further, uh, he's uh, giving him an example of Jesus Christ. He's talking about uh, Jesus Christ in verses uh, 13 uh, to 16, we read that uh, last week. Um, he says, you know, uh, he talks about Jesus as an example uh, who himself did not go back on his call, his purpose, and his testimony, even when he was brought before Pontius Pilate and he knew that, you know, this is going to lead to his crucifixion, to his death, um, uh, you know, and he just holds fast. Uh, to his confession of faith uh, and to pursue what is eternal, to pursue the will of the Father, to do what the Father has called him to uh, do. So he gives uh, Jesus as an example and he says, in the view of this, you know, you too, Timothy, must pursue what is eternal and you need to hold fast to your confession of um, uh, faith. And he says, you know, um, uh, he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus. So he says, uh, you know, it was it was Jesus Christ who gave him this command, uh, who put him here in this position, who purposed him to be there in that place uh, to uh, oversee the churches at Ephesus. And um, Jesus himself knew what it was to fulfill you know, a command and a position as difficult as Timothy uh, uh, is in at present because he witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate and Jesus, uh, you know, uh, did not go back on his purpose call and his um, testimony. And, you know, how did Jesus... Um, you know, witness a good confession before Pontius Pilate. He did it to several ways. First thing is, uh, you know, Jesus admitted the truth about himself. Uh, he agreed with Pilate's statement that uh, he was the king of the Jews. Um, the second thing is that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus testified to Pilate about the sovereignty of God, uh, saying that, you know, uh, telling Pilate that you could have no power at all against me unless it was given to you from above. Uh, John chapter 19 was 11. So Jesus uh, testifies to the sovereignty of God and he tells him, uh, tells Pilate that, you know, you, he could not have any power against him if it had not been given from above. So Jesus uh, lets Pilate know that God was in charge and not Pilate. Uh, God uh, uh, was bringing about this turn of events and what is going to happen because he is in control, he is sovereign and not Pilate. And the third thing uh, is that Jesus was silent about specific accusations. Uh, he refused to defend himself um, uh, and leaving his will to the will of God the uh, Father. So he's saying, uh, Timothy, you know, even as you are in this position, you know, uh, admit the truth, speak the truth, you know, teach the truth. Uh, he's been telling him, preach, teach, 
uh, the truth from the pulpit. You know, don't get into uh, uh, baseless arguments, foolish discussions with all of these uh, false teachers. But what you need to do is you need to teach the truth God's word, uh, just as it is, teach the doctrines, teach the truth in God's uh, word. And the second thing is, you know, uh, you need to understand that, you know, it is because of God's will and plan and purpose that you are in this place, that you are put in this position as a spiritual overseer. And God is in charge. You know, even as he has put you there, he's faithful. He will complete what he has begun in you and he will accomplish what he wants uh, to be done in and uh, through you. And then also he's telling Timothy, learn from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, how when he faced um, Pilate, you know, he was silent about specific accusations. He refused to defend himself, you know, uh, do that and, uh, you know, just uh, uh, leave your life uh, to the will of God the Father and he will uh, undertake for everything that uh, is concerning you that needs to be done at um, the church at uh, Ephesus. So it's also a good reminder for us, you know, even as we are in ministry, sometimes the going gets tough, it's very difficult, it's very challenging, you know, we feel like quitting because uh, we have different people gossiping about us or putting us down or, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming against us. And when we know that we are in the right place doing the right thing and we are in God's call, that's where God wants us to be. Um, and we are honoring God in the way that we are conducting our lives, in the way that we are going about doing things, then, you know, just remind yourself about what Paul reminded Timothy about how Jesus did not go back on his call, his purpose, and his uh, testimony. Because it's easy, very easy for us to quit our post. It's very easy to say, hey, I've, you know, done with this. I, you know, I just can't minister here anymore. Um, there's no point. Um, but if you know that God has called you there and God wants you to stay there, unless he tells you to leave, uh, unless he opens the door for you to exit, uh, and you know you have to be there, uh, you know, you stay there put uh, knowing that, you know, um, uh, you have to pursue what is eternal and hold fast your confession of faith, just like Jesus did, and do the three things that I just listed out or I said, you know, what Jesus did when he uh, made a good confession before Pontius uh, Pilate. And God who's called you, God who has positioned you there, you know, he sees, he knows, uh, even as you leave, his, uh, you leave your life uh, to doing his will, you know, he will do what is required. He will work. He will fight your battles. Um, he will give you the grace and the strength. He will remove, remove people who, you know, shouldn't be there. He will bring in people who uh, would support you, would encourage you, would strengthen you, and just continue to do uh, the work of God in that uh, place. Okay? So uh, in these ways, uh, we see that Jesus made a good confession before Pontius Pilate. And when Timothy was told uh, to live up to this good confession he made, uh, he was simply told to do what Jesus uh, did. Now, why, uh, you know, why does Paul use these descriptions uh, in this context? Uh, because as I said, you know, Timothy was under fire in his ministry and Paul wanted him to remember that uh, it was God in whose presence he's, he's living, he's, uh, he's uh, serving God. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is both the giver of life and the one who sustains uh, life. Uh, uh, so even as, you know, people are threatening to kill Timothy, uh, but, you know, uh, he doesn't have to fear or quit or run away because uh, he needs to know that, you know, uh, God will either preserve him from death or give him the courage to be faithful witness unto his death till he dies. Um, even uh, uh, as we look up to the example of Christ who faithfully bore witness before Pontius Pilate, um, you know, uh, he he knew that he's going to be crucified, but he did not seek to save his own life. Uh, but he uh, he testified what was the truth. He witnessed, he made the good confession of faith before Pontius Pilate. Um, and yes, he was crucified, uh, but he also, uh, you know, rose again. He ascended back 
and uh, uh, to his position of being God again. Okay, so that is the encouragement. That is what uh, Paul is telling Timothy, look for what uh, holds on for eternity, you know, and what has eternal significance and consequence okay and he says you know how long timothy was supposed to fight the good fight he says until our lord jesus is uh, uh, appearing okay so he says um here in this uh, verse mm, you know that you verse 14 that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until lord jesus christ appearing so how long do we continue to face all the challenges in our christian life go through all the difficulties the persecutions the hardships you know how long sometimes he asks how long god you know and so paul is telling timothy you know um uh you know you're supposed to fight the good fight of faith uh you know um until the lord jesus christ appearing or if he died before that, you know, before his appearance till our uh, death, okay? And he says uh, here, he who is, okay? Um, uh, and yeah, verse 15, which uh, he will manifest in his, in his own time, and he who is the blessed and the only potentent, the king of kings and the lord of uh, lords so he is, he's saying that he who is he's saying that you know he's telling timothy uh know that you know christ jesus has equipped you to fight the good fight so know who is this god you're serving know who is this god who has called you uh, know who is this god who has uh you know purposed this in your life and put you in this position it is jesus christ himself and even as he has called you and purpose that you be in this place in this position he has also equipped you to fight the good uh, fight so it's not just you he's called you and purposed you and just put you in that place but he also has equipped equipped uh, sorry he's also given you the the required things that needs to equip you to fight the good faith and even as you are equipped to fight the good faith you know he will strengthen you and he will do all that uh, con concerns you he will sustain you through every season and uh, will give you the grace and the uh, strength and you know paul goes on to then describe uh, who uh, Jesus Christ is to Timothy. You know, uh, it's just amazing in all of Paul's um, episodes when he writes, he never loses an opportunity uh, to testify uh, of the person and the work of uh, Jesus Christ. He never loses an opportunity to testify who Jesus was even before he became man, uh, even before the foundations of the earth, who he was as man, what he accomplished, what he did, because the whole uh, purpose of, um, of uh, Paul's mission or his the whole purpose of his life is to exalt Jesus Christ, is to make him known, is to testify testify about him it's not to testify about the works that he is doing or what the great apostle or a missionary he is but his main focus is to just basically to preach christ you know to testify about who he is uh his 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 deity his humanity uh his 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 person his work what he has accomplished so even if you look at we studied romans you know he just uh even as he um discusses and brings in the law and uh, the forefathers and the uh, abraham he talks about all of those things uh, uh you know he he even talks about the person and work of jesus christ so even if you look and uh, study first timothy and second timothy there are various instances where he you know he testifies about who this uh, jesus christ is and this is uh one such place where he is um talking about who this Jesus Christ is, he says he's blessed and the only potentate, uh, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who, is, who no man has seen or can see, 
to whom be honor and everlasting power. So he's reminding Timothy, you know, who this God is, who has called him, who has uh, equipped him, who is sustaining him, and is giving him the grace and the strength to fight his good uh, fight. So the he's he's the blessed um, potentate, uh, means sovereign, who's a leader, who's a ruler. So Jesus Christ is the one who alone has all power and strength, who rules the entire universe. He is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Uh, he is truly uh, immortal, without beginning, without end. He's the only uncreated, self-existent being who is not subject to uh, death. And look at what he says. You know, he's he's God who dwells in unapproachable light. Uh, he refers to uh, when he's talking about God who lives in unapproachable light, he's basically referring to um, the splendor of God's inherent uh, glory and especially of his unapproachable uh, holiness. So he's talking about this great God, how great this God is, how big, how mighty or awesome he is, who lives in unapproachable light. That means, you know, the splendor, the awesomeness of this God, you know, uh, is so, uh, uh, is inherent, uh, means, you know, it is, it's just natural, it's just part of who he is, it is his characteristic, it is just basically who he is, his being, that he lives in unapproachable light, the splendor of his majesty, awesomeness, his glory, you know, and that he is unapproachable in his holiness and uh, you know because he's he's so great he's so holy he's so uh, you know uh, he's so glorious uh, that no sinful human being can even dare uh, to draw near to this God but you know he's saying that it's because of the grace that is in Christ Jesus that you um, you know, we can approach this God who lives in unapproachable light. We have access to this God uh, who is holy and we are sinners, but we can approach the holy of holies, uh, the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy in time of need. Why? Because uh, of uh, the grace of Jesus Christ, it's because of what Jesus Christ has done uh, for us. So he's saying that, you know, he's reminding us that, you know, this God is so unapproachable. He lives in unapproachable light, which means like, you know, um, just like we won't dare to put a man on the sun, you know, we won't dare to do it because we even can't approach uh, anywhere close to the sun, because if we do, we would be burnt along with the person that we would want to, you know, put on the sun, uh, because they would be instantly consumed, you know, uh, millions of kilometers away from the sun is even something that we can't even, you know, dare to even venture out or near or think of going. So, <clears throat> sorry. When we can't even look at uh, the sun with our, you know, for a, just for a split second uh, without being blinded with our bare eyes, uh, just imagine, you know, God is even uh, uh, so much more brighter uh, than the sun. He's so glorious in his splendor, in his awesomeness, in his glory. Uh, but even uh, though, uh, you know, we cannot know this, this God who lives in unapproachable light uh, and uh, who's, who lives in unapproachable holiness, uh, who's sovereign, immortal, uh, unapproachably holy, uh, this invisible God, you know, uh, who we cannot know, who we cannot see, we, who we cannot understand. Uh, but he says, thanks be to um, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, who... Uh, came and became man, deity becoming humanity, you know, and choosing to reveal uh, God to us and who we can touch and see and feel and, uh, uh, you know, have this tangible experience and relate to, you know, it's because um, of uh, Jesus Christ. And he's saying that, you know, um, this God who's unapproach who lives in unapproachable light, uh, who no man can see or has ever seen, you know, we can know him. Uh, through Jesus Christ, and we have access to this uh, unapproachably holy God, uh, uh, and we as sinners can approach Him. It's because of the grace and the mercy of God, and and. Uh, 
just saying this, you know, uh, Paul is, um, you know, just bursting out into just worshiping and honoring uh, this God who is uh, who has everlasting power and to whom uh, is due and is to be ascribed uh, to. Okay, and uh, you know, it just uh, you know uh, also opens our uh, understanding. You know, even though God is so great, so awesome, so glorious. Uh, you know, who we cannot even see, uh, but, you know, is someone who has, uh, uh, um, someone who has um, uh, condescended to a level where we can approach him. He has come down to a level where we can know him, we can relate to him, uh, we can uh, uh, speak to him, we can hear of him, from him, you know, just this wonderful access that we have to this this great, awesome, glorious God is because of what Jesus Christ has uh, done. And I think uh, this should, you know, um, kind of bring us to a place where we are also uh, living a life that is holy, uh, 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 pleasing, acceptable to God, and also coming to a place where we know what we have received because of the person and work of Jesus Christ, and also standing in awe of this God who is even though he's so great, you know, uh, it's just um, opened himself to us. Uh, and, you know, we can um, receive all of his fullness. We can participate in all of his fullness, in all of his uh, uh, greatness, in his glory, just experience him in such a, a personal and tangible uh, way. And this should be just enough for us, uh, you know, uh, to honor him, serve him, uh, to worship him, uh, and give him all the glory and honor that is due to uh, him. So he says, to whom be honor and everlasting power, knowing who this Jesus is should bring us, uh, you know, bring forth this response, not primarily uh, what he can do for me, not just by saying that, hey, I can approach God's throne of grace, receive answers, uh, you know, receive grace and mercy in my time of need, but our response should just be simple and saying, God, you know, I just want to worship you for who you are, uh, what you mean, what you have done for me, what you've opened up for me, what you have given me as a spiritual uh, inheritance, and just declaring his honor and everlasting uh, power because, um, you know, he is this uh, great God. And uh, so Paul is praising and giving glory and honor uh, uh, to this one God who is exalted, enthroned, um, and to Jesus Christ, who has made this God known to us, who's made a way for us and access to approach uh, this great, infinite, um, uh, holy, and a God who lives in unapproachable um, light. Okay, and uh, he he says that you know this uh, 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 Jesus Christ who has revealed uh, God to us, uh, his alone immortal. Uh, and he also lives in unapproachable light. That means he's also, you know, a unique man who alone is immortal. And he also is a glorified man because remember, he's 100% God, 100% man, fully God, fully man, uh, 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 deity uh, uh, and humanity coexisting in the person of Jesus Christ. So even as God is uh, lives in unapproachable light, you know, even... Uh, 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 Jesus Christ, who's the second person of the Trinity, is this glorified man because he lives in unapproachable uh, light. So Paul is praising him uh, and enthroning and exalting Jesus Christ because he's this unique man who alone has immortality compared to any other human being. And he is this glorified man because he is, uh, 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 he is God who lives in unapproachable light okay so he's just talking about again who the uh, the person of jesus christ is that he is alone immortal and he is glorified man who's living in an approachable light any questions these verses verses 13 to 16 Okay, there are no questions, then uh, we will move on to verses uh, 17 to 19. So can somebody please read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19, please? 
Thank you, Harrison. Can somebody please read uh, verses 17 to 19, chapter 6? Okay. Um, First Timothy 6, verses um, 17 to 19. And it says, um, 16 to 17 to 19, okay. Command those who are who are rich in the present uh, present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain, uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, sorting up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay, lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Harrison. So he's talking about those who are rich in this present age. Uh, he's telling them that they must use their riches responsibly. Uh, you know, if uh, uh, you know if they use their riches or good stewards of their good stewards of the riches that God has entrusted to them, the blessing that God has entrusted them, you know, in this present age, if they use it as good stewards and they're responsible, they will also be rich in the age too. Uh, come and he tells those who are rich not to be haughty which means he's talking about pride you know uh, pride is a constant danger with riches it's very easy to believe that you know um, we have more uh, than any other man and so we can do things and no one can stop us no one can question us uh, that is being haughty that is being proud and he's, he's uh, telling um, those who are rich not to be haughty, but uh, he says, uh, and also he tells them not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living uh, God, okay? Uh, he says that riches is uh, temporary, you know, it's not, uh, it's not something that will last for, et for eternity, and he's saying don't put your trust in riches, and... Um, uh, you know, God knows our tendency to trust in riches instead of him. Uh, and he guards us, you know, against this danger uh, because he wants us to trust uh, that he is uh, somebody more trustworthy, uh, eternal, somebody they can put their trust in. So he's saying, uh, telling Timothy, you know, trust in God, telling uh, the the believers, the saints at Ephesus, you know, trust in God. Don't put your trust in uncertain uh, riches. And then he says, let them do good that they may rich be rich in good works, ready to give. So he says, those who are rich, they should be use their blessing, their riches in a responsible way, being good stewards, you know, uh, giving to others, doing good. Um, and he says, you know, when they do that, they will guard their heart from materialism and trusting in uncertain uh, and, and trusting in their riches, which is uncertain, uh, which is not permanent. OK, um, yes, we know that uh, having riches is not wrong in itself because God blesses. Uh, his people with riches, with wealth, uh, with money. So it's not wrong to uh, have money. It's not wrong to make more money because uh, we need to multiply. Now, if you look at the parables of the, you know, uh, uh, of the steward and all of that, God wants us to multiply, invest, to multiply our wealth, our riches. But He wants us to do it in order that we bless His kingdom, that we can. Uh, extend his kingdom, give into kingdom's work, give into mission work, bless believers. That is what the early church did, right? They sold everything that was uh, uh, which they had and they had things in common. They blessed those who are in need. Um, and there was great unity, oneness, and the power of the Holy Spirit was uh, so mightily moving among them. There was great signs, miracles, and uh, wonders. So he says, those of you who are rich, you know, be good stewards, be uh, uh, take responsibility for your wealth, be generous, uh, knowing that even as you give away your wealth, uh, you're actually laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You're actually laying up for yourselves what is eternal. You're going to get an eternal um, reward. And he says, lay hold on eternal life. So Paul's idea was to, for Timothy was to leave the pursuit of money aside and be content with 
um, his work as a minister of the gospel. He says, um, you know, uh, that his hand is not too big enough to lay hold of two things, you know, lay hold of both riches and money and uh, what is important for eternal life. But he says you can have, you can lay hold of just one thing and that is lay hold of what is eternal, uh, you know, uh, two things that will um, build up for your eternal life, which will uh, give you rewards for uh, eternity. Okay, and then in verses 20 to 21, uh, he talks to Timothy or tells Timothy to guard what has been entrusted uh, to him. So can somebody please read verses 20 and 21, please? Yes, ma'am. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to that trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have heard concerning the faith, grace be with thee. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So he says, God, what was committed to your trust? So, you know, the gospel uh, or the salvation message, the truth about Jesus Christ, the doctrine, the personal work of Jesus Christ that has been, uh, you know, entrusted to us, uh, committed to us as uh, or committed to uh, a person like Timothy, who was a pastor and overseer and also committed to us as believers. You know, we need to be committed to that trust to holding on to the truth, to communicating the true, pure truth of the gospel. Uh, and he says that, you know, when this trust is broken, you know, some people have strayed away from the truth, they have shipwrecked their faith. Um, and he says, you know, he tells Timothy uh, that you need to do all you can do to keep your trust, to hold on to this truth and to this faith. And so also, you know, uh, even as we read this, even as God has entrusted the truth of the gospel, uh, the doctrine of the gospel to us, the doctrines, the various doctrines in the word of God and the doctrine of Jesus Christ, we need to hold on to this. And, uh, you know, we need to be committed to uh, sharing and speaking and teaching the pure truth of the uh, gospel. And then Paul closes with this admonition to Timothy to guard, which means uh, to keep, to preserve, to watch over what has been given to him uh, and what has been entrusted to him is the truth of the gospel and the ministry that has been given to him. So in the same way, we need to guard, which means we need to preserve, keep, watch over the truth of the gospel, the doctrines, uh, the manifestations and the person, the work of the Holy Spirit, the person, the work of Jesus Christ. We need to guard this, preserve it, watch over it, teach it uh, to people. And he says, again, he reminds him, you know, uh, in the close of this letter, avoid, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting into foolish arguments, contradictions, babblings, you know, discussions with all of these false teachers who think they are talking sense, they're making, uh, you know, talking uh, great, deep, profound truths and knowledge, uh, which is falsely called knowledge. He says to have nothing to do with them. And then, uh, you know, he ends his uh, letter by saying, you know, uh, when you hold on to the truth, you will not stray away, you will not shipwreck your faith. And then he blesses him with um, grace. Okay. Uh, and he says, the grace of Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that's how he ends his letter. Okay. We'll pause here or we'll go for our break and come back. And after our break, we'll take any questions uh, regarding chapter 6 of First Timothy. And then we'll continue on with the uh, Second Timothy. Okay. We'll see you after the break. Thank you.